Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. The Apostle Paul upbraids them here really for a, really for having the discernment, the intelligence, if you will, the spiritual wisdom of children, of uh, you know, trying to be king of the pile instead of edifying the body. For in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Prophesying serveth not them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not all say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Here Paul shows the purpose for tongues. The purpose for tongues was is a fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter, let me see if I have it written, 28 verse 11. And uh, as a fulfillment of that prophecy, it's a sign to unbelievers. It's not something for the edifying of the church. It's a symbol to the unbelieving Israel that judgment is coming. Uh, prophecy edifies and builds up the church. And then he gives a scenario. Imagine an unbeliever or a baby Christian comes into the church and everybody is babbling. He'll say that you're all mad, you're all crazy. But supposing he comes into the church and everybody's prophesying. Or we'll say in this day and age, since the Bible is complete, uh, and there is uh, the preaching of the Word of God and people are speaking about the Word of God in the service, he'll be convicted in his heart and uh, he'll say, you know, God is here. If people are working through the power of the Spirit how they're supposed to, um, he'll be convicted of his sin and he'll come to God. It says, how is it then, brethren? And here uh, Paul gives a proper usage for tongues in the church that uh, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If every man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most three, and that by of course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Here Paul gives the rules for tongues, really, in verses 26 through 40. He, he tells them how it's supposed to be done. The, no more than two, maybe three people at the most in the entire service are supposed to speak in, uh, in that unknown tongue, and there has to be someone to interpret, or else just don't do it at all. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. What this is talking about is, you know, basically they would have uh, someone give some kind of prophecy or something, and uh, it seems that they would have someone who would judge it, say, yes, this is accurate according to what God's word has been written earlier. No, this is inaccurate. That seems to be what that's talking about there. That was, I believe, the practice in the very, very early church. Um, if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. They're supposed to be doing things one by one, and the spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. Everybody's supposed to be in control of themselves. They're not supposed to be uh, going off crazy. And uh, the modern tongues movement, the ecstatic utterance speech is... Uh, is really all about craziness and confusion. Back in Pensacola, they used to have a thing called the Holy Rollers, where people would roll and laugh in the parks. There'd be people in suits rolling and laughing in the parks, and uh, it didn't glorify God, it glorified man, and really was very, very confusing to lost people. The Bible says, furthermore, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted for them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as it saith in the law, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What it's talking about here is, you know, the people who are speaking in tongues, the people who are prophesying, that would be someone occupying the room of a preacher. And the women aren't supposed to be preachers. That's something God has ordained. The man is supposed to do, not women. Um, talks about this in 1 Timothy. God has ordained that a man is supposed to be the preacher, and women aren't supposed to be. That's how he set things up. And uh, they had a problem in the church, apparently, of there being a... Uh, 
women who were preaching also in the service, and that wasn't being done how God had it. He then says, What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that are written unto you of the commandments of the Lord. So what Paul tells them is, if there's anyone who's spiritual in you among you, if there's anyone who's a prophet, let them acknowledge this, basically let them believe it. And he says this, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. <clears throat> what he's saying is, if you don't want to believe this, if you don't want to fall after the word of God, you're ignorant of the word of God, you're not spiritual, and you're not a prophet if you don't want to obey these things this way, he writes to that church. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. In the church of Corinth there was great chaos, there was great seeking after the flesh, it was madness. The Apostle Paul says to covet basically to uh, prophesy. So they really, the point was not even really to seek after tongues, but really to seek after the word of God. And he commands that all things were to be done decently in order. From this, we see a number of things about tongues in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And uh, Roman numeral 3 here is basically what was going on inside that church. Um, in approximately AD 55, the use of the gift of tongues is one, it was known languages. I'm sorry, capital letter A on the Roman numeral 3. It's known languages. Verses uh, chapter 14, verse 10, verse 18, verse 21 make it clear that it's a known language. The Greek word glossa refers either to a literal tongue, as in the one in my mouth, or to a literal language. Glossa is never used in the Bible to refer to an ecstatic utterance. And uh, most scholars also say that glossa is never used in Greek to refer to an ecstatic utterance either. In the entire usage of the ancient Greek language, it didn't refer to uh, an ecstatic utterance to someone uh, gibbering and babbling. The purpose of tongues, uh, capital letter B, assigned to lost Israel. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11, I'll turn to it and read it. The Bible says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. God promises that uh, he's going to basically, and if you read the whole context of the passage, it's talking about the coming destruction of Israel, and uh, this was fulfilled in A.D. 70. Furthermore, we see that tongues is inferior to prophecy in this passage. If you read through this pro passage, you should definitely come away with the impression that prophecy is superior to tongues. <clears throat> and also we see about the rules. What are the rules? One, only two or three people by service, and that by turns. They had to take turns. An interpreter had to be present. No women were permitted to speak in tongues in the service, and everything had to be done decently and in order. Now, uh, here is something I brought today as the illustration. If you turn your paper over, go ahead and look what it says on the back. If you can... Some of you have black bank blank backs. <laughs> Who all has stuff on the back of their pages? A few of you do. Okay, so we have. Oh, you got something on the back of your page. Um. Well, let me switch with you. And we can hold it around for those who are nearby. Do you want me to interpret this? Oh, uh, if you can. <laughs> but no, I'm speaking right now, so you got to wait your turn. Uh, just joking. The person who can tell me what this is talking about, who can tell me what the use is of this, wins this genuine, real life Sacagawea gold coin. Now, we won't spend long looking at that. Um, is this Latin or something? Yeah, it's Latin. Yeah. But, uh, Which one? On the back of the page. Oh, I don't have that. Oh, sorry. Uh, is this it's it's making a reference to pain in the first uh, five words. I like how you picked that up. Going to labor. And, uh, <coughs> are you yep. going to have pain from now on? <coughs> well, you have to tell me what is the usage of this text. Where is it commonly seen, found, and used? A um, so, uh, yeah, medical manual of some sort? No, it's not medical at all, actually. The point is, is this is very confusing and pointless. <laughs> That's the truth of it all. I'll tell you at the end of the lesson, 
what it is and what it's used it's for. It's from Traffic Court.